Hello everyone, today I am going to tell you a little bit about obscenity in the Middle Ages and how much it differed from our own. This is Irina, I'm a historian and teacher, and if you want to support me with this channel, do hit the subscribe button, I would be very grateful. The main source for this talk is Melissa Moore's fascinating book, Holy Shit, A Brief History of Swearing, so if interested, make sure to check that out, it's really worth it. So, around the year 950, there was a monk called Aldred who added an English gloss to the Latin text of the Gospels, translating Thou shalt not commit adultery from Matthew 5.27 with and don't sard another man's wife, neser thu odres monis with, in Old English. The question is, what is a word like sard doing in the Bible? It is a sacred book, so crafted for the honour of God. Nevertheless, the priest translated uh, the Latin word with a word which is basically the F word in, uh, let's say, contemporary English. I cannot say because it's not YouTube friendly, but uh, you get the point. The use of sard is more the rule than the exception. In the 1370s, for example, four centuries later, we have John Wycliffe and his associates trying to uh, work out an English version of the Bible so that ordinary people who didn't know Latin could understand God's word directly. And here you can find stuff like you shall not offer uh, to the Lord any beast whose bollocks are broken. In British English, bollocks was and is quite obscene. Uh, the American version balls uh, more or less. Uh, you can also find stuff like the Lord will smite you with the bulls of Egypt on the parts of the body by which turds are shut out. So the version uh, they concocted is definitely much more obscene by our standards than the usually euphemistic Hebrew Bible or the Latin Vulgate. The naked truth is that words such as bollocks, sart and even cunt were not regarded as obscene in the Middle Ages. Generally, people of those times did not share our modern concept of obscenity, in which words for certain taboo functions possessed some kind of power um, outside of their literal meaning. They were concerned with other things, such as foul words, but these words were not equivalent with obscene words. Foul words were any words that could lead people into sin, so words that had a bad moral effect. Any word for that matter could be a foul word if its use enticed its speaker or hearer into doing some sort of evil, whether that would be uh, theft or murder or gaming, whatever. The worst, most dangerous kind of language in the Middle Ages was swearing, but swearing at the time had a very particular meaning, the biblical meaning. It referred to oaths by God. The holy provided the strongest taboos. Within the thousand years of Middle Ages, say roughly from the fall of the Western Roman Empire up to the 1500s, there were however signs that this attitude was changing and becoming more like the contemporary one. Combined with the rise of Protest Protestantism and with it a strain of Puritanism, this, um, let's say, civilizing process slowly transformed formally um, innocent words into what modern observers would recognize as obscenities. Words that to modern eyes would be obscene appeared everywhere in medieval English. Shitro was the common, ordinary name for heron. Pissabet was the name for dandelion. Windfucker was the kestrel. Kanthor was a word for smartweed. So a lot of words used to designate um, animals or plants. Medieval street and personal names also featured words that would we would consider to, need to be obscene nowadays, such as Grobe Cunt Lane in Oxford or um, Shitwell Way in Warwickshire and several towns even had the name the Pissing Alley as a street name. You also had surnames like Thomas Turd or Robert Cleave Cunt. Dictionaries and Vulgaria, books designed to teach young children how to speak Latin, were also full of such terms. The Ortus Vocabulorum, for example, printed in the 1500s, defines the Latin vulva as Anglica Quante, so a cunt in English. Likewise, arse was the standard way to refer to the buttocks. Arse, shit, fart and bollock really date from the Anglo-Saxon times or the early medieval times. Other obscenities are uh, of more recent date. The Abbot Elfric's 10th century collection of Latin English vocabulary calls Nate's arse muscle and anus us whole. Despite their name, Vulgaria was, were not supposed to be collections of bad language. They are vulgar in the old sense of the word, meaning common or vernacular. 
These lists of English words and phrases with their Latin translations were used in medieval and Renaissance grammar schools by boys 7 to 12 years of age. The Vulgaria compiled by John Stanbridge, for example, in 1509, included not only parts of the body, but also uh, phrases a schoolboy needed to know, such as if you want to say, I am wary of my life, um, you could say, I am almost be shitten. Medieval schoolmasters were concerned with bad language, but Stanbridge Vulgaria makes it, makes it clear that words such as be shitten or turd or piss or yard, that would be a man's penis, uh, or asshole were not it. Medical texts were also full of terms we find obscene today. Um, how a man's yard has two holes, one for urine and one for sperm, how the bollocks collect blood to make sperm and what to do if a man's penis gets accidentally cut off. Well, if you must know, you should anoint him with oil of roses above his ass and the region of the yard and then burn him with a hot iron to stop the bleeding. Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is also very scatological. He often uses terms like turd, shitten, ass, and he's also very liberal with swive, which along with sard was the direct word for copulation until the F word came along in the 1500s. The term dite is also used being a slightly more polite way to say the same thing, akin, akin to today's screw. Mystery plays, which were performed on religious holidays and which dramatized events from biblical history, were also fairly obscene by our standards. So these are words we still employ nowadays, but there are also many obsolete ones like sard I mentioned before, or you also had kekia, identifi identifiable as the clitoris, or pinto, tars, or yard, with yard actually an euphemism for uh, the male uh, body part. Um, also meat and wear were also words used by women as metaphors for their husband's penises. Which leads us to the question, how did people insult each other in medieval England if these words were that innocent? To learn what people said to abuse and offend each other 700 years ago, you can look at court records for charges of defamation or slander. When scribes wrote down the precise English words at issue, instead of Latin or French, they were usually accusations of sexual immorality, such as whore when directed at women and accusations of dishonesty, such as uh, thief, robber or false. You could insult by telling someone something like, you are, thou, are, thou art a false man and a false harlot to me. Harlot originally meaning beggar or vagabond, a term that indicated low social status and later linked to character. Look at noble, for example. In the other direction, we have villain, who was originally an unfree tenant, uh, churl, any person not uh, noble or member of the clergy, knave, a boy child, uh, wretch, an exile, caitiff, a captive or slave. Occasionally, men were insulted with sexual terms too, including cuckold, horson, or whoremonger. Some of the badges were by pilgrims, feature motifs we would consider to be more appropriate for um, some other kind of journey. Um, so they used to wear winged phalluses, for example, or vulvas hunting on horseback or climbing ladders, a crowned vulva on um, a phallus also appears, and um, it is assumed that some of these badges used mockery to protect pilgrims and the sacred relics that inspired their travels. Um, there was a parody, for example, with a figure of two penises carrying a vulva um, of an icon of the Virgin um, Mary and similar figures can be found in churches beginning around the 12th century. You have the stone carvings of naked women exposing their genitals, for example, or men with huge uh, penises. So these were, these were very public images. No shame was involved here. If you're wondering what was shameful to perform or show in public in the Middle Ages, um, the short answer would be not that much. There was almost no such thing as privacy as we know it, even for the rich. The earliest houses consisted of a large central great hall and a few outbuildings. 
most of the business of life was conducted in the hall, where one might openly perform some bodily functions we would most definitely conceal today. Erasmus of Rotterdam, for example, announces that it is impolite to greet someone who is urinating or defecating, implying that it was normal to run into people doing that. There are court regulations too, stating that no one, whoever may be, before or after a meal, early or late, um, should foul the staircase, corridor or closet with urine or other filth, uh, but go to a suitable and prescribed place for such a relief. So yeah, people st still did do that in the 1500s. In the halls of the High Middle Ages, people apparently felt the urge to spit much more than we do today, and um, did it whenever they wanted and wherever, in the wash basin, on the table, over the table. Um, also, it was thought to be unhealthy to retain wind, so there was definitely quite a lot of farting and belching. Um, moreover, people bedded down in the hall as well, uh, on floors with a layer of considerable filth. Um, the lord and lady of the manor probably would have had some kind of chamber to themselves at the head of the hall, at first behind the curtain, but then as a solar, a separate uh, bed, bedding room. But even then, these rooms were not private in our sense. Most people slept naked, moreover, and this meant that the sight of total nakedness was an everyday rule, and it was much more likely uh, than, um, um, than, we now, than us nowadays to witness scenes of um, sex. Medieval people lacked what we feel is embarrassment or a feeling of shame when one's own functions are exposed to the gaze of others. They could freely do and say things that we tend to conceal in our actions and language if we want to be considered polite. This is a major reason that words that are, that are, that are obscene to us today were not so in the Middle Ages. The things represented by cunt and sod and shit were much less charged. They carried no taboo and thus were not considered as powerful as today. But that's not to say that such words were not used in insults and jokes. Characters in mystery plays, for example, use excrements to insult each other. So you can find Noah calling, calling his wife uh, Ram's diarrhea, for example. The early 15th century Speculum Christiani, The Christian's Mirror, contains a pretty exhaustive list of the ways your tongue could get you into trouble, none of which is by speaking obscene words. So we have, for example, unlawful tasting, eating or drinking, idle chattering, um, taking God's holy name in vain, false promises, slandering, scorning, um, discord sowing, false judging, um, despising, unskillful pleading in a court case, vain arguing, foolishly laughing, and so on and so forth. So pastoral texts worry about any words that might lead to, may lead to sin. So it could really be anything from saying cunt to reading a poem. The equivalent of modern obscenity was not really foul words, but oaths. Swearing, as we saw a little earlier, uh, historically meant oath swearing so if you broke your oath god was supposed to punish you either directly by sending you a plague or upon you or your children or indirectly through the strong arm of the person with whom you broke faith a broken oath for example was the cause of or at least some kind of justification for the norman conquest of england because harold earl of wessex found himself in normandy at the court of its duke william the bastard the future william the conqueror to inform uh, him that he had been chosen as the heir to the english throne after edward the confessor whether he arrived there by accident or design harold swore an oath of fealty to william but then he acceded to the throne himself in trials by ordeal the witchcraft trials post medieval to be fair God was thought to be judging the guilt or innocence of the accused. If the person was innocent, God would intervene directly to make sure that they were not burnt by the iron or whatever fun things people did back then. Um, false swearing would damage God's honor and reputation, denigrating the holy name that language should instead praise and glorify. Well, eventually people did realize that God didn't always punish the culprit. Um, 
Nevertheless, swearing by the parts of God's body was also considered improper swearing, for example, by the blood of Christ, by God's arm, bones, and so on and so forth, uh, because it was considered a perverse version of the sacrament. In the uh, Eucharist, the priest speaks a working word to create God's body, then breaks it with his hands. In swearing, those who utter this uh, formula can break God's body with their words alone. So there you go. A couple of fascinating facts about how obscene medieval people were. I uh, hope you got to know them a little better. And until next time, please support me with a subscribe so I can grow this channel and make more interesting content in the future as well. All the best.